disciples. Then, after the resurrection of Jesus, it came to how many? About 120 very committed followers. But then, after the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, what does it, what does it expand to? By the way, this is pretty quick church growth, isn't it? From 120 in a few hours to over 3,000. Now look at the note just a minute, and you'll see that this was the Greek custom. They only counted so unfair. They only counted adult men. That means at Lighthouse today, we would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sorry, David and Joshua. What, Josh, how old are you? 14? Oh, he counts. Eight. It, they were 13 after. Yeah, that he's. So eight. Get light. Nine. 10, 11, 12, we have, we have 12 people. <laughs> if, if you were to ask at that time, okay, how many, uh, how many attended church at Lighthouse on Sunday? You would say 12. <laughs> That's a little discouraging, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so, um, wait, 13, did I count Brother XP? He was seated over on the side, 13, we're growing, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, um, and that young man's too young. Sorry, it's going to be a while before he gets counted, okay? Um, so, was it more than 3,000 that were added? Many, many more, because there would also have been women and, uh, and people and, and guys, or I don't want to say boys, but uh, those below the, uh, b below the age of adulthood, around age 13, 12 or 13 or so, around, around that. Um, so there would have been many, many more, but that's how it's counted. Okay? So what else do we see? There's another first in this passage. It's the first local church. And then I've given you some definitions. Devoted, fellowship, and generosity. This is for your own study. We'll come to it again a little bit. Um, we'll come to it a little bit later. If you'll see at the bottom of the page, look ahead. Uh, by the way, the compare, the reference part, that's for you to do on your own later. Not now, please. Okay? But at the bottom of that page, look ahead. Chapter 3 will be the first record of a miracle, the first miracle of the church. And when we get to that part, we'll be moving faster. So you can check that on your own. So if you want to now, you can turn to the back side. And on the back side, we'll be going into, um, we'll be going into our message for today. Praise the Lord. God has good things for us today. Amen. Amen. So what do we see here? What do we see here as we look? Let me... Let me get myself arranged a little bit so I can keep up with, so we can keep up together. Peter starts preaching to this group, and if some of you have not been with us last week, uh, you can go back and check the message. You can go back and check the handouts. But Peter has started his message. The people have gathered, and in Acts 2, don't worry, that's a baby, okay? <laughs> this way. In Acts 2, 16 through 18, Peter tells the onlookers that what they see and hear is explained by the prophet Joel um, around 700 to 800 years earlier. We talked about this uh, last week as well. There's no natural explanation, and the people are not drunk because that's the claim. Peter says this is the prophecy that Joel gave. And here's this wonderful passage. It was our key verse before. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And the word prophesy includes anointed teaching. It's not just somebody who stands and says, Thus saith the Lord. We sometimes think of that as prophecy, right? When somebody prophesies. It can include that, but it is not just that. Let me give you another example. There will be times when I am preaching, and I always prepare, and Pastor Rene as well. He would say the same thing. But have there been, have you ever noticed, there will be some times when in the preaching, or with other preachers as well, there will be a special touch. Have you ever, have you ever felt that before? A special anointing, right? A special, it's just something, it's as if the preaching has been going at this level, the preaching or the teaching has been going at this level, and suddenly it's at this level. Have you felt that before and seen that before? All of us have. All of us have. And you say, well, why isn't it like that all the time? Because this gift 
of prophesying that Peter is talking about here is not always given. It's not always given in the same way, but you will hear that you will feel sometimes at times like this. That is included when it talks about prophesying or some, sometimes when somebody is teaching and it's an anointed teaching, that's included in prophesying. Every once in a while, you may have been in a service before that somebody will stand up and will give, sometimes it's called a message in tongues. Maybe they speak in tongues, okay? Somebody speaks in tongues and it's very special. You know this is a message. It's not just we're all praying in the Spirit. And then somebody else will stand up and somebody will give the interpretation of what was said in tongues. Now, a lot of you may not have heard that or seen that before, right? But some of us have. That's included in this part as well. Um, and then there will be other times. How many of you remember a few times when either Pastor Renee or I, at times, it wasn't even when we were standing up to preach, one of us maybe stood up to pray for all of you. Or one of us stood up, I think a few weeks ago I did, and I said, uh, today, and I, and I gave you an exhortation and an encouragement. Do you remember that? It was, it's been a few weeks ago. That is included in prophesying. That's included in prophesying. And so God, Peter says that God is going to do this in the last days. And that's his explanation for all of these people to all of these people as they're saying, what is going on? Peter says, this is part of what God is doing. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to ask you something this morning, and I've prayed, God help me to get through everything that we get to, we need to get through today, but I think this is important. Look at what is written in verses 16, 17, and 18. God has promised to pour out His Spirit on you, on you. If you are a child of God this morning. I don't care if you are a young child of God. I don't care if you are an old child of God. I don't care if you are a son or a daughter. Here it says you're young men. Do you know who's included in young men? Included in young men? I'm so sorry, Brother Stephen, you are not included in the young men. <laughs> but let me tell you who would be, Kitli, I'm sorry, not even you would be included in the young men. But Joshua, you would be included in that. Joshua and David, you would be included there. Nat Nat, you would be included there. Those of you that are younger, uh, your daughters, the young women, you're included there as well. And so our question that we really need to think about this morning is this. What we read in verses 16, 7, and you too, Anne-Marie, you're, you're, you're one of the daughters there, okay? She was laughing. She thought she escaped. Nope, you're included if you're a Christian. If you're a child of God, this is God's promise to us. It really is. And I'm not making light of this. I really mean it. And I've called some of you by name not to put anyone on the spot, but to encourage you and to exhort you and to kind of kick you a little bit so that we can look at this and understand this is what God has said he's going to do. And so our question for ourselves, not in condemnation, but our question for ourselves, every one of us, is this, God, is this my experience? Is this my experience? This says they will prophesy, you will see visions, you will dream dreams, all, all and, and by the way, don't limit this, oh, I'm a young woman, so I won't see a vision. Uh, I'm, I'm an old man, so I won't, uh, so I only dream dreams, or I don't do that. This is, uh, this is a broad picture here. Brothers and sisters, truly, my question to you is this. Does this describe your Christian experience? Yes or no? Most of us this morning would say, mm, not really, not so much. What you're talking about here, Pastor Jennifer, that's like for the pastors, you know, visions and dreams and prophesying. I disagree. Because the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, God, he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh, on those who are his servants. And so, brothers and sisters, this morning, what I want to say to you is this. If this does not describe your Christian experience, I urge you, come to God and say, God, you have promised, you have said, you will pour out your spirit on all people. I am one of your people. And you pray that to God. And you keep praying that to God. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you this morning, 
God loves you. He values you. He wants to pour the gifts of his spirit on you. And he wants to use you. He wants to use you. When God gives you the gift of prophecy for a person, it may be something that prompts your heart and you may go to somebody and you may encourage them and you may say something to them about, I really feel like I want to encourage you in this. And when you do that, God is using you for a specific situation and it is a blessing and it is an honor to be used by God. This is for you. This is for you. So when Peter explains this to the crowd, if you're looking at your notes, you'll see it right here. This is what he tells the crowd. This is what they understand. God is willing to give his spirit to everyone. Number two, that we are in a period called the last days. What does it say? Verse 17, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit. What else is part of it? Let's look at the next, next click. What it also means is, part of this is, I will call that the judgment of God will follow, will surely follow. Just as surely as God, look with me, just as surely as God has done this in pouring out His Spirit, this will also be part of the last days. It will be part of the last days. And that is why we make sure we're right with God. That is why we tell others what Peter preaches here in verse 21. And, uh, and um, uh, is it in the next? Uh, uh, one more click. There we go. Verse 21. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Those of you who were, were, not, who were in the first service last week, you missed the... the uh, Sister Gurley's testimony, I gave you a small part of it. I gave it in the second service, and I gave it uh, very, very briefly. But you can go talk with her and find out more. And as I was preaching, the Holy Spirit prompted me, reminded me of that in her life when she was in a terrible situation and in a terrible place many, many years ago, completely isolated, completely on her own. Nobody even really knew what was going on with her, and most people didn't know where she was, and she was by herself. Sister Gurley, were there any Christians around? No Christians at all. And she was in a hospital bed here in Hong Kong. And she said, I remembered, some of you know the story, right? Ami knows the story and a few others. And she said, I remembered what mommy, my mom, had said. I remembered she had said, if you will call on the name of Jesus, he will save you. Just as simple as that. And in that hospital bed by herself, really messed up. She was really messed up. Sister Gurley very simply called on the name of Jesus and Jesus saved her in every way. Not just a physical, sal not just a, a spiritual salvation in every way. Because we need saving in a lot of areas, don't we? We need, sometimes we need saving in our hearts when, with our feelings and our frustrations and our, our despair at times. Oh God, have you ever thought, oh God, it can never change? Will help ever come? Will hope ever come? Will my life ever change? When you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. When you despair for your families, oh God, what could ever be done? When you call on the name of the Lord, He will answer. He will answer. And because a time of judgment is coming, brothers and sisters, this must be part. This must be part of our Christian lives. This must be part of our testimony. This must be part of our prayers for those that we love. And for those that we don't love, but that just we, that we know. That we know. I've got a list of people, I'll be really honest with you. I've got a list of people. There are people I really love that need to be saved. And I'm praying for them. But do you know what? I've got a whole other list of people. I can count them on quite a few fingers. I don't love them, but I know them. And maybe I'm the only Christian who knows them. And so I've got a whole group of people that I'm praying for. I just added two this week. I met them in the gym when I went to work out. One of them is named Raymond. And one is named Simon. And I've just started praying for them because I've just met them. I've just met them and I, know, and I know that they have not yet called on the name of the Lord. You and I, are you a Christian this morning? Listen, brothers and sisters, of course you have a whole group of people, family members and loved ones. This is the sound of growth in a church. 
you and I have a whole group of people that we love so much and that we're praying for, don't we? Do you have a list of other people that you may not love, but you come into contact with that you are praying for? You should. You should. I mean it. I mean it. Because you may be the only Christian that they know. You may be the only Christian who knows them. You may be the only person praying for them. Amen? Amen. Hmm. 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 Okay. So, Peter begins to preach. And then he gives proofs as we, as we, as we continue. He keeps on preaching. And I told you last time, the Bible says that Peter preached for a long time. He preached much longer than Pastor Jennifer and Pastor Renee. He preached for a long time. But Luke just gives us four short things. And let's look very quickly. He wants to give them proof. Remember who he's speaking to. The crowd he's speaking to are people who crucified Jesus and who rejected Jesus as the Messiah. So what he wants is to get them to the place where they will come to Jesus. So he begins to preach, and he begins to give proof. What do we see first? First of all, he says, he gives the first proof. This is in your notes. He gives four proofs that Jesus is alive and that, it is, that he's God. And the first proof is the life of Jesus. Okay? So the first proof is the life of Jesus and his mighty deeds. And then he talks about how he's alive, okay? How God raised him from the dead. Now notice right here, notice right here that Peter does not say he was the Messiah. Do you see that? He doesn't say that Jesus was the Messiah. He just says, Jesus, you remember that one? You know what I'm talking about. And they all did. They all did because many of them had seen the miraculous deeds Jesus had done and they'd heard his teaching, okay? But they rejected him. They said, oh, he's crazy. He's this, he's that. They crucified him. And so Peter says, first proof, his life, and you know it. Second proof, he comes all the way down to their most honored king. Who is their most honored king? David, King David. And he says, remember the prophecy that David gave? David gave a prophecy, but look at the prophecy. David is dead. See, there's his tomb. So David is not talking about himself. David had to be talking about somebody else. And he was talking about this Jesus. So the second proof is what? It is the prophecy of, that David gives. Okay? What happens next? And then, uh, let's go to the next passage. So they're the first two. And then he goes into this passage, which is a wonderful passage. He says, God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Here's proof number three. Here's proof number three. The proof is eyewitness. This is the strongest witness that you can ever have, right? So it's in verse 32. So the third proof that Peter gives as he's preaching is, we are eyewitnesses. We have seen Jesus raised from the dead. And they're all standing there. Now some of you might say, yeah, but anybody can tell a lie. They could have just stood up and said, we saw him. But they didn't. Remember this. They had crucified Jesus. So when these people stand up and say, we are witnesses, it is not a popular message. They could be crucified for it. They could be judged for it. They could be thrown in prison for it. They're certainly, they could certainly be rejected for it. And so they stand up boldly, but they stand up boldly and they say, we saw him raised from the dead. And so it's a very, very strong and a very, very powerful witness. And then... What is the last one? Verse 33. It's right here. Now he's exalted to the highest, to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. So here's proof number four. Proof number four that Jesus is alive is the pouring out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, when Peter said this, this is a great reminder for the disciples as well. Because remember what Jesus said before he left? Jesus said, I'm going to go to heaven and in a few days, I'm going, I'm going to ask the Father and in a few days, we are going to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when the disciples were baptized with the Holy Spirit, do you know what it spoke to their hearts? What it spoke to their hearts was Jesus is back in heaven and he's seated next to the Father and he's done exactly what he said he would do. And so here is the fourth proof. And Peter tells them the pouring out of the Holy Spirit is proof Jesus is alive and he is back in heaven. And then 
he comes to the climax of his sermon. Let's look at what happens and what he says next. What he says next, sorry, is this, verses 36 and 37. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. Uh Uh-oh. That's hard preaching, isn't it? That's hard preaching. He has been made Lord and Messiah. Now, why is this important? Peter brings it all together because he wants them to know Jesus was not just a good person and Jesus was the Messiah and that Jesus was not dead. You see, a a dead person who is good and dead is no good at all. I didn't say that very eloquently. I have it written in my notes more eloquently. We'll come back to it in just a minute. But somebody who's just good and who is now dead will do no good for them. A good dead person can do nothing for them. A dead person can do nothing for them. And so he wants them to know, he's bringing them to the point, the one that that was your hope, you crucified him, and he's the Messiah. Now this is awfully hard preaching, but why does Peter preach this way? Let's see what happens next. Verses 37, it says, His words pierced their hearts, here's the work of the Holy Spirit, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Why do they say this? They have just committed the greatest crime in history. It's the greatest crime in history. Their Messiah they have crucified. Their Messiah they have rejected. Their only hope is gone. Now, you and I, 2,000 years later, we can look back and we can say, Yay! Jesus has grace and love, and they're going to be saved. But brothers and sisters, stand with them in their shoes this morning when Peter preaches this, this sentence. Imagine you are in that service. You don't know what's going to happen next. All you know is Jesus the Messiah, you rejected him, and you crucified him. And how could he forgive you because you've done a really bad thing to him? That's where they're standing. And so their response is what? What should we do? Let me tell you something. When they say this, I want you to understand something with me. When they say this, brothers, what should we do? They are not even asking. They're not even asking, what can we do to be saved? They're not even saying that. Do you understand that this morning? They're saying, in effect, Oh no! What can be done? We have no hope. There's no hope for that. Imagine what they're thinking. We crucified him. How would they ever think that the one they rejected and the one they crucified would then turn around and say with love, I forgive you. I love you you and my death brings you life this morning. They didn't know that. They didn't understand that. And the only thing they could see from the bottom of the pit was, what should we do? What should we do? Oh, brothers, this is where they're going to meet amazing grace. How sweet the sound. And what Peter says next is this. What does he say? Next slide, he says, Repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Can you imagine what they felt? From no hope, the person that they had killed is the very one who turns around and now says to them, I give you hope and I give you life. There is still a chance. That is amazing grace. That's amazing grace. I have met people before who have told me, I've met them before, who have told me this, I am too far gone. God can't help me. I'm too far gone. I've done too much. God cannot love me me. My life is too messed up. I can't be fixed. I'm too broken. It is to people exactly like that 
that Jesus offers his amazing grace. He offers his amazing grace. He offers his amazing grace. Oh, how wonderful the love of Jesus is in our lives. Amen? Amen. 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 Sometimes we kind of feel like, well, I'm, you know, it's easier for me because I'm a good person anyhow. And we miss the truly amazing grace of God. But the grace of God, the grace of Jesus is amazing. Now, let me move sideways for just a minute, and then we'll get into the second, ha the second part as we, come, as we come near the end, the second part that we're going to get to this morning. Okay? Some of you say, do we need to get this part? We do. What does Peter say to them? He says, repent and be baptized, right? Now, you know what? For the Jews to be baptized was terrible. It was awful. Do you know why? Because Jews didn't have to be baptized. If you were a pagan and you wanted to join the Jewish religion, you had to be baptized. Okay? So when Peter says to them, all you Jews, you're so self-righteous, you've got to repent and be baptized, it was a big deal. It was a big step. Only a person who's really getting saved, only a person who's really going to follow Jesus is going to be willing to publicly be baptized because that's a big deal. That's saying, I'm just like those terrible pagans. I'm just like all of those Gentiles if they were willing to be publicly baptized. And Peter says, repent and be baptized. But then he says something else. Be baptized in whose name? Uh-oh. We've got a problem. When you were baptized, how were you baptized? Pastor Renee and, Renee and I baptized you or somebody else baptized you? How are you baptized? We baptize you in the name of the Father. Father? Uh-oh. No Father. We baptize you in the name of the Son for the remit Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and in the name of the No Holy Spirit. What is happening in this verse? What is happening in this verse? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever met someone? It's quite common in the Philippines. Have you ever met someone who has been baptized or rebaptized in the name of Jesus only? Yes? Only Jesus. You've been Anita raised her hand. Now some of you are saying, "What? What are you talking about?" I want to mention this just as we go in passing. We need to you need to understand this because you will meet people and maybe that was your background as well. No, I should be baptized because you see, when they all got saved, they were baptized in the name of Jesus only. Okay? Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So if you're not baptized that way, it doesn't count. You got to be baptized again. What is Peter saying right here when he says this? Is this what Peter means when he says this? You see, people that are baptized just in the name of Jesus, they look at this verse and a few, a few other verses, but they look at this verse and they say, see, I should be baptized only in the name of Jesus, not in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No. Understand what's happening here, okay? What's happening is this. This whole crowd rejected Jesus. They accepted the Father, and they're learning about the Holy Spirit now, but Jesus, the one who would give them salvation, was rejected. And so Peter has to bring them to the point where the one they, they rejected, they will now accept. Remember what Jesus said? Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and baptizing them in the name of the Father and do you think just a few days after Jesus told Peter that, Peter's going to change what Jesus said and said, ha, okay, Jesus is gone, I'm going to change it now. We're just going to baptize in the name of Jesus. Do you think Peter did that? Of course he didn't do that. Of course he didn't do that. But Peter is making a point, the one that you rejected, you have to accept. And remember what this says? This says Peter preached a long time. So Peter is not changing doctrine. Peter's not changing doctrine. He's just telling them the one that you accepted, the one that you rejected, you've got to accept him. So brothers and sisters, if somebody comes to you and tells you, how were you baptized? Oh, you've got to be rebaptized. You must be baptized in Jesus' name only or it doesn't count. You say, no. I don't have to be baptized in that way. And you can explain to them from this verse. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, by the way, may I say something else? And I don't want to offend anyone this morning. If you have been baptized 
in the name of Jesus only and not in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may I, may I suggest something to you? You should be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus said. Amen? Amen. That's what Jesus said. And at our next baptism, you can be baptized. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Okay, let's move forward. Let's move forward. What do we come to? Oh, right here. He says, this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. And guess what? Elizabeth. That Elizabeth right there. Elizabeth, are you in this verse? She's nodding her head, but she's not sure. Jessalita, are you in this verse? I don't see her name anywhere. Ami, are you in this verse? Where are you, Ami? All who are far off. Okay, brothers and sisters this morning, this is where you are in this verse. If you are a child of God this morning, you are in this verse. All who are far off. This means people who are far away by time. In time, and it also means in space and in ethnicity. Do we have any Jews here today? Any Jewish people here today? You sure? Because you know there are tribes, there are Jewish tribes somewhere in, in, in China. Okay, no. But you are included here because this verse also means the Gentiles. We're all Gentiles here today, right? We're all Gentiles. So my question to you is this this morning. Okay, I, in fact, go ahead and give us the next verse, uh, Joshing. He continued preaching for a long time. He strongly urged all his listeners, save yourselves. And then what happens next? Here's the response. Next, those who believed what Peter said were what? Okay. Those who believed what Peter said went to church for six months and took baptism classes so that they understood everything about baptism and memorized 20 scriptures about baptism. And then they were baptized. Is that what that says? No. Hey, brothers and sisters, they were baptized immediately. Immediately. If someone believes in Jesus, get baptized immediately. Immediately. And by the way, sometimes, I know we sometimes get stuck at Lighthouse because we only do it once a year. We are willing to do it more than once a year if we can find a bathtub somewhere. You help us find a bathtub and we will, and we will baptize more than, one time, more than once a year. They were baptized immediately and they were added to the church. Listen carefully. In the new church, here's a picture of the new church, okay? In the new church, there were no unbaptized believers. There were no unbaptized believers. Every one of them, whoosh, in the water and up. There were none that said, well, I'll think about it. I'm not sure about it. Well, maybe later, uh, after I settle some things, there were no unbaptized believers. Number two, there were no unspirit baptized believers. That didn't sound right, did it? <laughs> that sounded really bad. Let me change it. In the early church, everybody was water baptized. In the early church, everybody was spirit baptized as well. Everybody was spirit baptized. That was the pattern of the early church. So my question to you is this this morning. Are you water baptized? Are you spirit baptized? Yes. You should be. You should be. This is the pattern and the picture of the early church. All of them. All of them were baptized. They were added to the church that day. How do you think they baptized 3,000 plus? Right? 3,000 plus. That was a bunch of people. They didn't have time for long testimonies, right? <laughs> they didn't have time for a five-minute testimony. It was pretty much you believe whoosh, and whatever. Probably all of the apostles were, were, um, were baptizing people. You know, I heard a testimony. I can't even remember. I don't, it was one of, the, one of the Congos, I think. I don't, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe Congo Kinshasa. No. Anyhow, one of them. I heard a testimony one time of an old missionary who had been a missionary in that area in a certain part of Africa. And the government had turned against Christianity and had forbidden. This was about, I don't know, many years ago now. And 
the government had forbidden water baptisms of Christians. This was many, many, many years ago. Not Congo, Kinshasa. It would have been another, the, the other Congo. And after a certain number of years, the government changed. And the, I heard the missionary give this testimony. And he said, it was an old, it was an old testimony. It was a recorded testimony. And, and you could hear, it was crackling. It was going like that. It was really hard to hear. And you, could, and you could tell from his voice, he was an old missionary. I just heard it. And he said, we're standing out here today by the river. And, I thought it was, and, it was, and he said, and as far as we can see, as far as I can see, there are people lined up to be baptized in water. Oh, what a glorious day this is. That just gives me chills when I think about that. As people came to be baptized, we, we should not be reluctant to, be, to follow Jesus in obedience in water baptism. It's a wonderful thing. It's a glorious thing. And we should not be reluctant to obey the Lord and receive spirit baptism as well. We need not fear Him. This gift, what did he, Peter say? This gift, it's for you. It's for you. You say, I'm not very spiritual. It's for you. You may say, I don't know very much. He is for you. I don't understand a lot. He is for you. This is the picture, and I didn't get as far as I wanted to, so we'll come back to this. But this is still, brothers and sisters, this is a good picture of the early church. They were all baptized in water. They were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. They all received every gift that God had for them. I urge you and I encourage you. Let's just close in prayer right now this morning. And I remind you of those first words that we looked at. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Lord, we're included in that. Lord, in this group today, we are your sons and your daughters. We are your servants. Among us, there are young men and young women. Lord, among us there are older men and older women. Would you, O oh God, pour out your Spirit upon your servants who are here, who are here. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, we want to see you moving in our lives, not just in the pastors, not just in the Philippines where Pastor Renee is this morning, not just in some other place, but Lord, you have promised, you said in the last days, you would pour out your Spirit on all people. And Lord, I'm one of your people. I'm one of your people. Oh God, pour out your Spirit upon me. Lord, I want to prophesy. Lord, I want to dream dreams. Lord, I want to see visions. Lord, I want to know your anointing. Lord, I want to be filled with your Spirit and speak in the languages that you give me. Lord, I don't want to be afraid of anything and of everything that you have said you would give us in these last days. Pour out your Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. God bless you. Brothers and sisters,